Hello friends, welcome back to our sixth module where we are discussing about the topic of reactor control. While uh, summer has already started to step up in different parts of India, but uh, we are in Gohati or at in northeast India, we are quite a bit blessed in terms of temperature and it is uh, quite chilly morning at Gohati. But uh, let us go back to our topic. Here on this particular module, we have already discussed about the role of prompt and delayed neutrons played in reactor control or on deciding the neutron flux profile. They are first we discussed about the prompt neutron kinetics to get an equation like this and uh, by putting the uh, terms like multiplication factor and the prompt neutron lifetime etcetera, their magnitudes. We have seen that it is quite difficult to control a reactor if it is operating solely based upon prompt neutrons. Rather the time that is available for us to put any kind of controlling mechanism or activate any kind of controlling mechanism that is extremely small. And uh, then we discussed about the role of delayed neutrons and in the last lecture that is in the second lecture of this particular module we have discussed the delayed neutron kinetics where we have got developed this particular equation. Here instead of considering 6 or 8 different groups of delayed neutron precursors we have considered just a single group and beta represents corresponding delayed neutron fraction. Uh, we have analyzed this equation and from there we have identified the condition of prompt criticality to be something like rho equal to beta. That is as long as the reactivity is uh, less than the delayed neutron fraction or at the limiting case it is equal to the delayed neutron fraction then uh, we have sufficient time to activate our control mechanism and it is possible to control the reactor. Basically because of this presence of the delayed neutron or the activity of the delayed neutrons only we are able to control a, pro a practical nuclear reactor. Now uh, towards the end of our last lecture that is in the, my last slide I had some technical glitches for which some part of the slides went missing and I had to write on the screen hopefully that was clear but still for the purpose of completeness uh, this is the slide that I had there I should have shown you there. Here uh, NT represents the uh, neutron density or number of neutrons per unit volume and its variation with respect to time n naught is the initial one and this is the expression which dominates the neutron kinetics where we have taken into consideration both delayed and prompt neutrons and uh, beta is the delayed neutron precursor or concentration or delayed neutron fraction rather where we are considering just a single group of delayed neutron precursor. And uh, here uh, this is, is omega 1 this is omega 2 and as I proved earlier omega 1 is extremely small compared to omega 2. Therefore, it is a second exponential term which dominates the temporal growth of this uh, neutron flux distribution and uh, from there we have identified rho s equal to beta is the condition for a controlled reaction. When rho equal to beta we call the reactor to be prompt critical and corresponding amount of react reactivity is called 1 dollar. It is an unit sometimes or uh, quite often used in nuclear industry to denote the condition or uh, to uh, signify the condition corresponds to this prop criticality. 1 dollar refers to the amount of criticality, amount of reactivity requires to achieve this prompt critical condition. Of course, the value of beta depends upon the fuel and as uh, the condition for prompt criticality is rho equal to beta. So, the magnitude of dollar that also keeps on varying depends on depending on fuel. Therefore, it is not an absolute unit. Like for uranium 233, uh, it is 0 0.0026 is the value of beta whereas for uranium 235 it is 0 0.0065. So, correspondingly the value of 1 dollar for a reactor operating on uranium 235 will be 0 0.0065 whereas if it is operating on plutonium 239 corresponding magnitude of 1 dollar will be 0 0.0021. But uh, once we know which fuel we are using in that reactor then we of course know what is the magnitude of 1 dollar and then the value of reactivity is uh, often uh, referred in terms of this dollar. Uh, in fact, 100 of a dollar is also called a cent just uh, equivalent to the currency denotion notations and it is quite common you will find in a nuclear reactor that it is mentioned it is presently uh, its reactivity at, at the moment is 10 cents. That means, uh, its reactivity is 10 percent of beta. Like if it is working on uranium 235, so 1 dollar responds to 0 0.0065 or 0.65 percent. Therefore, 10 cent will refer to 0 0.065 percent and hence his reactivity will be 
0.065 in that case uh, 0.065 percent I should say. With this we have uh, discussed about the role of prompt and delayed neutrons on determining the criticality or the reactivity of a thermal reactor. And uh, let us now move to the mechanisms which are used in practical reactors to achieve this particular con control and the most common one of them is the control rods. Control rods are some elements which can be of the shape of rods or plates or tubes which contains materials which has very high absorption cross section. Therefore, whenever this kind of elements or this kind of structures are present inside the reactor, they can eat up a significant portion of the neutrons in the neighborhood area and accordingly they can reduce the uh, reactivity or they can reduce the neutron flux distribution there, neutron flux concentration there. Therefore, just by uh, this is a schematic diagram on the first hand on the left hand side the diagram shows uh, this particular situation where uh, the all the control rods are completely inserted into the reactor and at the moment there may be some value of reactivity that is present. Now, if we remove these reactors or uh, by a certain distance then the corresponding absorption cross section effective absorption cross section corresponding to this control rod that reduces and hence the neutron flux concentration that neutron concentration inside the reactor that has to increase. There accordingly by uh, changing the position of these control rods we can control the amount of neutrons that are available to cause fission reaction. Generally the position of these rods are properly calibrated that, that means uh, depending upon what level of reactivity you want we can always say that this is the this should be the position of the control rods and accordingly they are adjusted. The uh, control rods serves in uh, serve several purposes. First, in reactor startup means at the when you are starting a reactor from the cold condition, then we need very high neutron flux. At the moment, generally control rods are completely outside; they are completely removed from the reactor, so that whatever amount of neutrons that are produced or that are supplied from some external source, all of them are available to induce fission reaction. So we get a very high rate of reaction, which keeps on increasing with time. And uh, as the neutron concentration keeps on increasing, then we may slowly get these control rods into the reactor, thereby putting some sort of control. And once uh, we attain the desired level of equilibrium, that is, when the number of neutrons produced um, because of fission and number of neutrons consumed by these control rods that uh, comes in equilibrium, then we can attain the proper chain reaction. And next is online reactivity control and power maneuvering. As I have mentioned, once uh, we need to change the multiplication factor of reactivity, we can change the position of the control rods. Like if we want to increase the reactivity, that means if our need is to increase the power production from the reactor, then we can remove the control rod by a certain distance so that the neutron concentration increases and accordingly we have an increase in reactivity. The opposite is true when you want to reduce the power production. There we need to uh, introduce the control rods a bit more, we need to insert them by a further distance. Then axial offset control, Gen as we have seen uh, in our discussions in the previous modules that the neutron flux while we want the neutron flux to be uniform throughout the reactor it is practically not possible, rather we generally have the highest neutron flux close to the center line and uh, much lower at the, uh, at the edges. If the reactor is an unreflected one that is there is no reflector then theoretically the neutron flux at the edges should be equal to 0. Now using the control rods we can somehow offset this uh, axial distribution or we can uh, that means we can uh, at the center line where the neutron flux is more there we can insert the control rods by a larger amount whereas close to the edges we can keep the control rods removed by a bigger amount so that we can maintain somewhat uniform neutron flux distribution. That means, what I am referring to if this is your reactor at the center line that may be position of the control rod which is inserted by a big amount whereas, at the edges it can be inserted by a much smaller amount. And by adjusting the position of these two rods or whatever axial distribution that we have of these control rods, we can uh, somewhat maintain, maintain a more uniform distribution. Then reactivity adjustment with aging. We have discussed this one also earlier as uh, time goes on once we have uh, loaded a reactor with fresh fuel the reactivity generally is very high because uh, 
there are more number of fuel isotopes available. But as uh, time goes on, the number of fuel isotopes keeps on reducing, and accordingly, the net fission cross section or net macroscopic fission cross section that keeps on reducing because that is directly proportional to the nuclear density. Now, that aging effect can be somewhat compensated by the use of control rods like at the beginning when the fuel concentration or concentration of fuel nuclei is very high we can have control rods inserted by a larger amount, but as the concentration of nuclei keeps on reducing then we can gradually take this control rods out. The next is uh, reactor shutdown. When there is a planned shutdown required, then we can uh, gradually get this control loads into larger insertion position, so that the reactivity keeps on reducing gradually. And uh, once these control loads are completely inserted, then they should uh, be able to eat up all the neutrons available inside the reactor, thereby completely stopping the reaction. So, the control loads are used both during the startup and during reactor shutdown. And then emergency shutdown which is also called SCRAM. I do not want to uh, expand this term just stick with this acronym at the moment. Uh, this is uh, related to an emergency shutdown. When there is an emergency need of shutting down the reactors, when this control rods are inserted very very rapidly that is uh, from uh, whatever position they were in at the moment, they go into the completely insertion position uh, within uh, a very short amount of time, so that they are able to consume all the available neutrons thereby completely stopping the reaction. So, control rods have important roles to play both during the normal operation to uh, norm, both and also during emergency operation. Normal during normal operation they can uh, adjust for the axial distribution, they can adjust for the aging and also they can be used for short time uh, power change that is by changing the reactivity to the desired level. And also during uh, emergency condition like emergency shutdown situation, the control rods are generally the most important mechanism to stop the reaction inside the reactor. Now, the material of the control rod should be something that has very high neutron absorption cross section. Okay, uh, actually, I have uh, missed one, the final uh, performance or final uh, uh, function of the control rods is load following with gray control rods. Gray control rods uh, are elements which uh, has somewhat a lesser uh, absorption cross section compared to the normal cross control rods, which are also called the black control rods. And uh, therefore, when there is a smaller change in the load on the reactor using these gray control rods also you can change the reactivity. Next, these are a table of some materials uh, and their cross sections. And if uh, of course, uh, only few selected materials I am showing here namely boron, uh, silver, cadmium, indium and hafnium and all their isotopes or most of their isotopes are shown here. And you can see out of this the boron 10 has an extremely high absorption cross section and cadmium 113 is a, again it is much much higher than boron 10. Hafnium 174 or 177 also has reasonably high absorption cross section and therefore, they can act as quite good material for this neutron for this uh, control rods. It is also important here I am uh, mentioning about absorption cross section, but actually all these cross sections are non fission capture kind because their fission cross section is essentially 0. Now, boron has two naturally occurring isotopes boron 10 and boron 11, boron uh, in uh, common ore you will find boron 10 to uh, of uh, 20 per to consume 20 percent by volume whereas, boron 11 is 80 percent, but boron 11 uh, has extremely small absorption cross section and therefore, boron 10 is a material which is primarily used uh, for control rods or any kind of control related machinery. Cadmium can also be used but there can be other reasons with cadmium which I shall be showing shortly. Hafnium, one big advantage of hafnium is that um, there are two isotopes hafnium, 560, hafnium um, 174 or 177 both have high absorption cross sections and also other isotopes of hafnium, hafnium like 178 that is also a bit reasonable amount of absorption cross section and therefore, hafnium can also be used for control rod. This is a typical profile for neutron uh, flask. The this particular curve corresponds to when there are no control rods. 
So, uh, because there are no control rods present, this is an unreflected reactor. So, at the center line, the concentration is very high, whereas close to the edges, the concentration is 0. However, once we have inserted one central control rod, then you can see there is an immediate reduction. This is the profile. You can see immediate reduction in the neutron flux profile at the center line. Of course, uh, that increases as we move away from the center and then decreases again to become 0 at the edges. So, just by using this uh, using this a single control rod, we can have uh, we can uh, make the difference between the center line value and this edges value to be smaller. And then if we can use some more control rods with a proper uh, orientation, then we can get a much more uniform profile which I have mentioned earlier. Now, just a single control rod therefore, is not sufficient rather we need to have several control rods and therefore, individual control rods are grouped into clusters and this uh, something like this. There are several control rods they are all grouped into grouped into clusters and uh, they are uh, connected at the top by a structure which is commonly called a spider and then they are inserted through the guide channels. This uh, because of uh, st uh, structural stability point of view just uh, plain boron powder cannot be used. So, use some kind of compounds of boron something like uh, boron carbide can be a very interesting one. Uh, so, pellets of boron carbides are generally used in control rods and uh, they look quite similar to the fuel rods and uh, they also are protected by cladding made of stainless steel. Yes. Uh, typically, we can have 50 to 70 number of such clusters in a modern day reactors with each clusters having about 20 rods. Now, in uh, PWRs, this control rod clusters are inserted from the top. The driving mechanisms and all other accessories are mounted at the top of the pressure vessel and uh, then they can enter from the top. But uh, in case of uh, boiling water reactor where we allow the liquid to change its phase and then the vapor phase that is a steam that is separated in a steam drum, there it is generally required to mount that steam drum to the highest possible, possible location and therefore, this control rod driving mechanisms are generally mounted from the bottom and control rods also enter the reactor from the lower side. As I have mentioned boron or cadmium are the two most important materials used in control rods particularly boron. So, this is the reaction that boron can go through when a boron absorbs neutron it uh, generally goes through a, an alpha decay process that is uh, it is pro it produces uh, a lithium 7 and one helium isotopes and in 6 percent of cases it reduce it uh, because of corresponding mass defect it emits 2.79 MeV of energy it really, but in rest 94 percent cases you will generally find one uh, gamma photon and 2.31 MeV of energy and the energy carried by this gamma photon or the kinetic energy of the gamma photon actually is the difference between this 2.79 and 2.31 thereby conserving the energy. Cadmium uh, it also absorbs a neutron and generally cadmium 113 which uh, has the highest absorption cross section that gets converted to cadmium 114. It is generally at the excited state. Uh, so, it releases one uh, it goes through a gamma decay process that is releases a gamma photon and then come back to the ground state. These are the absorption cross sections for these two isotopes that is uh, boron 10 and cadmium 113. In case of boron 10 it is very interesting to observe that there is hardly any resonance that is as we are moving from a very low energy level like the thermal energy level corresponds to 0 0.025 electron volt of energy that is uh, 2.5 into 10 to the power minus 8 electron volt which will be somewhere here. So, from that thermal range to quite high energy levels like here it is uh, showing something like 10 MeV at the highest one it is more or less a straight line distribution. However, in case of cadmium there is a significant absorption zone resonance absorption that is and that is one reason that we should be careful about using cadmium 1 on 3 as the control material. Boron is quite easy to use and uh, we can see that does not have any kind of resonance absorption and hence that may be is the primary reason of going for boron or boron 10 I should say as the common material for uh, absorption or co control rods rather. 
This is another technology along this chemical shim is something that is used along with the control rods in, in means all practical reactors generally use control rods, but chemical shim is an additional technology that is used generally with PWRs that is pressurized water reactors. In chemical shim, we use some kind of soluble powder commonly a boric acid H3BO3 which is a soluble white powder and it is uh, mixed with the water which is present inside the reactor pressure vessel and uh, it creates because it is soluble it creates a homogeneous mixture and thereby occupies the entire portion of this reactor. So, uh, it is able to compensate for uh, reactivity by a uh, or the change in reactivity with the change in the fuel concentration. Therefore, it is in a way method of long term reactor control not a short term one or um, it is also in a way it is uh, not a measure which can uh, be used under in case of emergency. Now, chemical shim also similar to boric acid also sorry <laughs> similar to the control rods it also has uh, import several characteristics like the acid concentration the concentration of boric acid generally is very high at the beginning of a fuel cycle and uh, as time goes on this uh, boron 10 isotopes that absorbs neutron gets converted to boron 11 and as we have seen uh, just two uh, slides back boron 11 has a negligible absorption cross section and therefore, it becomes uh, a dormant means it does not take any further part in this. So, as time goes on the concentration of this acid or concentration of uh, boron 10 isotopes that keeps on reducing, uh, but uh, the you should also take into account with time the number of fuel isotopes that also keeps on reducing. Uh, in a properly designed reactor, the rate at which reactivity decreases because of the depletion of fuel uh, should be nearly equal to the increase in reactivity because of the reduction in boron 10 concentration. And if we can achieve that kind of situation, we do not need control rods at all. Basically, in a properly designed uh, pressurized water reactors, chemical shim alone is able to take care of all the regular operations or day to day operations. Uh, control rods are generally are uh, almost removed condition. Only if uh, there is a rapid change in reactivity required, we use the control rods and of course, in under emergency situations. During the initial phases of the fuel cycle, it alone is nearly sufficient to continue the operation without the support of control rods like I have just mentioned. Uh, but as time goes on the concentration of boron 10 reduces and when we approach the end of a fuel cycle, its concentration virtually becomes 0, which is also an indicative that we need to refuel the reactor again. Uh, small power changes can also be achieved. Is, uh, by changing the concentration of this boric acid that is by adding some further uh, acid powder or by adding some further coolant, we can change the concentration of the solution and so smaller change or fine tuning of this reactivity can be done. Uh, yeah, also it creates a homogeneous solution therefore, it helps in avoiding the unevenness in the neutron flux distribution and the another important uh, issue is that because of the appearance of this boron tin, uh, the decay of the boron tin often is found to lead to the formation of tritium. In fact, the decay of boron tin or neutron capture by boron tin is the primary mechanism of tritium formation. And also like it is also true for the control rods, uh, whenever uh, a boron absorbs a neutron, it can undergo a alpha decay process and the helium that are produced because of that alpha decay that increases the pressure inside the reactor which also helps somewhat helps in this entire procedure. But uh, chemical shim also has its own limitations like it is essentially a slow process it uh, for any change in concentration several minutes are required. Higher concentration of boric acid may lead to positive temperature coefficient of reactivity which is highly undesirable we shall be discussing this shortly the positive temperature coefficient of reactivity you please keep in mind and also for the moment you assume that the positive value of this temperature coefficient of reactivity is undesirable which may happen if the concentration of boric acid is too high. And also it is not uh, not suitable for boiling water reactors because whenever there is a phase change inside the reactor the concentration of boric acid uh, that keeps on increasing.
So, that can significantly affect this reactivity. There can be a third mechanism which is called Barnable absorbers. Barnable absorbers again mechanism is always the same that is to use a material with high neutron absorption cross section just the mode of introducing that material that is different. Like in case of uh, control rods we are making this uh, material in the shape of rods or plates and uh, inserting those into the reactor or removing as per our need. In case of chemical shim we are making this material in the shape of a soluble powder or in the form of a soluble powder and then distributing that inside the reactor uniformly distributing that solution. In case of Barnable absorbers we have separate pins or plates uh, which are placed permanently inside the reactors. In certain situations they are also added to the fuel itself that is this Barnable absorption sometimes may become a part of the fuel pin itself. This also their activity is quite similar to the chemical shim, but uh, they are located at some they are fixed at a particular locations and therefore, they can control the neutron flux profiles around that location. Thereby, they can reduce the required number of control rods. They can also reduce the initial concentration of boric acid in case of the chemical shim process and then similar to the chemical shim, they can also compensate for the initial activity of fresh fuel. As the fuel uh, becomes older, fuel starts to age, then these uh, Barnable absorbers also after absorbing neutrons they also keeps on uh, becoming inactive inside the reactor. Uh, quite similar to chemical shims, therefore, the reduction in uh, reactivity because of the decay in fuel generally gets compensated because of the reduction in this boron concentration or this absorber concentration. The negative reactivity uh, decreases with time and as the material gets converted to low absorbing material and uh, as I have mentioned this negative reactivity or reactivity reduction should be the same as this positive reactivity decrease of the fuel. Along with boron, uh, gadolinium is another material which is very commonly used as Barnable absorbers. Gadoliniums 155 and 157 are two isotopes which probably has the highest absorption cross section among all natural isotopes. Like for GD155 has an absorption cross section of something like 61,000, and that is significantly larger for 157, which is uh, 254,000. And these are the corresponding uh, their variation of their cross section with energy. And you can see in the thermal energy level, it is extremely high. You can compare this with the figures shown for boron, tin, and cadmium earlier, and you will find this is at least two orders higher compared to them. That is why gadolinium can also be used that is particularly used as Barnable absorbers. So, these are the uh, common modes of reactivity control. There can be a few others also some innovative methods like reflectors sometimes can also act in uh, controlling the reactivity somewhat because we know that reflectors are used to uh, prevent the leakage that is their objective is to the get this neutrons which are leaking out of reactor back into the core. And by changing the orientation of this reflectors we can control this neutron leakage and accordingly we can control the neutron flux inside the reactor. In certain uh, innovative designs some removable fuel rods are also used like when we need higher reactivity instead of removing the control rods this removable fuel rods are inserted and uh, accordingly that can increase the reactivity inside the reactor. And there can be a few other mechanisms also, but generally control rods and chemical shims are the most control rod is universal mechanism and chemical shim is also you will find particularly in both pressurized water reactors and these two are the most common mode of reactivity control. Now, we, we come to the term which may, was mentioned shortly before temperature effect of coefficient of reactivity. Reactivity we now know the how the delayed and prop neutrons uh, modify the reactivity and we have also just studied the practical mechanisms by which you can control the reactivity. Now, we are going to see the effect of uh, different parameters on this reactivity like the temperature, like the fuel burn up etcetera. So, related to temperature the first term is temperature coefficient of reactivity defined as the rate of change of reactivity with temperature. And we also know that the definition of reactivity is equal to k minus 1 by k where k is the effective multiplication factor and that is equal to 1 minus 1 upon k 
if you introduce the definition here then it comes to be 1 by k square d k d t. And uh, for most of the reactors uh, initial condition k being equal to 1 this is sometimes written by this uh, form shown by blue color as well, but we can stick to the original form that is 1 upon k square into d k d t. Now, when alpha t is positive that is when we are having a reactor which is having a positive value of this temperature coefficient of reactivity. Then what may happen? You can uh, just uh, look at this expression here k square is always a positive quantity in fact, k is itself is always a positive quantity here alpha is also a positive quantity. Let us write this as d k d t is equal to alpha t into k square. Now, we are taking alpha t to be positive k square itself is always positive. So, for d k d t is also positive. So, whenever there is a rise in temperature there will be a rise in the reactivity and uh, as the reactivity rises that means, the power produced by the reactor that will also rise. So, energy released by the fuel rods that will uh, further rise further and hence that will cause further increase in the temperature of the reactor core, the fuel pin, the moderator and all the materials involved. So, that will cause even further increase in the reactivity. That means, once the temperature starts increasing for a reactor with positive value of this alpha t, the reactivity keeps on increasing continuously. And uh, unless we put some kind of intervention through some kind of controlling mechanism, the reactivity will keep on increasing infinitely with even a small change in its temperature which is a very much undesirable situation. So, the reactor is inherently unstable with change in temperature. When alpha t is negative then what may happen? In that case our situation is uh, d k d t is negative. So, if the temperature increases then k has to decrease. If reactivity decreases then the power produced by the reactor that also decreases and hence the temperature of the fuel pin the moderator that will come down and once that starts to come down that will affect the reactivity again. Therefore, uh, it is in a way is acting like feedback mechanism in a and is trying to get the temperature back to its original thing original value. That is any change in temperature any rise in temperature here will cause a reduction in reactivity which itself will try to uh, reduce the temperature and uh, thereby it will lead to a very stable situation and therefore, a reactor which is having a alpha t less than 0 or a negative value of this temperature coefficient of reactivity it is a very much stable reactor. We can study the other case also like if there is a reduction in the temperature any temperature reduction will cause an increase in the reactivity and once the reactivity increases. So, the power produced by the fuel pins that will increase. So, that will try to increase the temperature level of the reactor and hence the temperature will try to get back to its original value thereby restoring the reactor back to its initial position. So, whenever this alpha t is uh, negative it will act like a proper feedback mechanism proper controlling mechanism to get the reactivity back to its original value. Uh, generally because of the thermal inertia of the different components of the reactor the temperature inside is not uniform like whenever there is a change in the reactivity is the fuel pin whose temperature will increase first then that temperature will be transferred to the cladding that energy will tra get trans transferred to the cladding and from cladding to the coolant or to the moderator and this entire energy transmission process may require some finite amount of time. And that is why the fuel rod and the coolant may not be at the same temperature at the at a particular instant. Accordingly, we sometimes defined uh, fuel temperature coefficient and moderator temperature coefficients. Fuel temperature coefficient refers to the change in reactivity with unit change in the temperature of the fuel. Similarly, moderator temperature coefficient of reactivity defines the change in reactivity with unit change in the temperature of the moderator. The fuel temperature coefficient is of particular importance that is also sometimes called the prompt temperature coefficient because it determines the first response of a reactor in terms of a reactivity change uh, when there is a change in either the fuel temperature or reactor temperature. This prompt temperature coefficient is probably the most important definition of, of uh, temperature coefficient of reactivity that is commonly used and as per our discussion that we shortly had we can safely say that it is mandatory that the prompt uh, temperature coefficient has to be negative or we have to ensure that it is negative at the design level itself. 
In fact, in several countries while uh, licensing a nuclear reactor, it is one of the most important criteria like in, like in United States, no uh, reactor is going to get the license unless it can show that the prompt temperature coefficient is a negative one. An associated effect is the nuclear Doppler effect. It is actually an another effect of this temperature itself. Now, uh, in all the discussions related to the neutron nucleus interaction that we had so far, we have always considered the uh, inherently assumed that the neutron is moving and the nucleus is stationary. But practically speaking, the nucleus itself is also not stationary. Because of its own thermal energy level, even if we are talking about a solid fuel, the nucleus there is vibrating always. And therefore, even when that particular vibrating nucleus is subjected to a beam of strictly monoenergetic neutron, uh, its interaction with different neutrons will be different. And accordingly, uh, this uh, nucleus actually will see this monoenergetic beam of neutron uh, to have a distribution of energy. And uh, this has a direct effect on the observed shape of resonance. Like look at this uh, figure that is shown there. At when temperature is 0 Kelvin, then that is that is at the absolute 0 condition, the fuel nucleus they are perfectly stationary. But as the temperature keeps on increasing, like in this situation, because of its own motion, it will find this neutron flux distribution to be much uh, wider. So, you can see the peak has come down to this, but the spread earlier when for 0 Kelvin where it was restricted to this, when it has gone to 20 degree Celsius, the spread is this much. So, this is a much wider level of energy, this is a much wider level of neutron energy for, wh for which this resonance absorption or resonance capture can take place. Uh, that thereby, uh, whenever an isotopes like uranium 238 or plutonium 240 are present inside the reactor which has very high ab resonance absorption cross section. Um, this rise in temperature can enhance the probability of resonance absorption. This is uh, another picture of the same thing like in the we are having two temperatures T 1 which is lower and the T 2 which is higher. Because of this uh, Doppler effect uh, in this is for T 1 we can see the resonance absorption is restricted to this zone, but for T 2 because of this new Doppler effect it is a much wider zone and but the peak is lower. And correspondingly while the neutron flux has a very sharp deep here close to the uh, um, close to that uh, resonance zone close to that particular energy level here the deep is smaller, but this drop takes place over a much wider energy span. So, this Doppler coefficient of reactivity is also negative in power reactor. As the fuel temperature rises, it becomes less negative, but it still always stays negative. And uh, as the concentration of isotopes like plutonium 240 keeps on increasing, it becomes a bit more negative. Let us uh, see mathematically the effect of this Doppler reactivity. Uh, we know from the definition of multiplication factor, it is a product of p into k infinity. k infinity is the infinite multiplication factor and p is the total non leakage probability which combines both fast and thermal non neutron uh, non leakage probability. So, k infinity can be represented by the 4 factor formula or if we assume all other parameters ap apart from this resonance to be constant, we can write in a form like this and now differentiating both sides with respect to absolute temperature, we get this. And from there alpha prompt can be remember alpha prompt can roughly be equated to this quantity as uh, k d is close to 1 in reactors. So, it is uh, equal to 1 upon p dp dt where p is the resonance absorption or resonance escape probability I should say. This was the expression for p that we have uh, showed earlier we have not derived it rather uh, this was a some kind of empirical relation corresponding to a reactor which uses uranium as a fuel. Uh, we got a more specific form of that where i is the integral where the integral is, integral is performed over this entire energy level of resonance that is from the first to the thermal neutron level. Uh, this is a very general expressions actually in earlier the expression that we have seen that was only for uranium 238 this is a very general expression where in the numerator we have the subscript f refers to fuel 
here nf is the nuclear density of the fuel and v is the volume in the denominator m refers to moderator vm is the volume of the moderator sigma sm is the scattering cross section or average scattering cross section of the moderator and uh, zeta m is of course the logarithmic energy decrement of the moderating isotope and during experiments it has been shown that this integral uh, can vary with temperature following a relation like this. Here T is the absolute temperature 300 Kelvin has been taken as a reference temperature. This is a purely experimental correlation uh, which uh, generally involves several kinds of isotopes, but primarily uranium 238 and also involves over a large range of temperature. Here A prime and C prime are two coefficients small a this one is actually the radius of the fuel rod, but it is given in centimeter. Similarly, rho bar is the density of the fuel given in gram per centimeter cube. And uh, A prime and C prime can vary with the fuel, these are the values that are given. Like for uranium uh, 238 in the form of uranium oxide, the A prime value is 61 into 10 to the minus 4. You please uh, take a note of this uh, point here this refers to actually the value of a prime for uranium 238 for this one is 61 into 10 to the power minus 4 and uh, c prime is 0.94 into 10 to the power minus 2. With these values we can uh, put the expressions for this uh, p into the expression for alpha prompt and perform the uh, differentiation with absolute temperature to we, so we get this and now by par integrating sorry by differentiating i with respect to temperature we get this here beta i is uh, nothing but this particular constant that is here this beta i is a prime plus c prime divided by a into rho bar and then by rearranging the term here uh, another replacement that we can do that is uh, if we put the expression for i at 300 Kelvin into this expression, then p at 300 Kelvin will be equal to exponential of minus NFVF by zeta m capital sigma s m v m into i at 300 and once we put it back here then we get this expression for this alpha prompt. So, this way by using whatever kind of fuel that you are using we can calculate the value of this uh, prompt reactivity note that this log of 1 by p at 300 Kelvin. Uh, can be an, uh, can also be written as log of minus log of p at 300 Kelvin, but we have kept this minus sign outside because we always want this alpha prompt to be negative. There is another effect the void coefficient of reactivity, which actually uh, refers to the rate of change of reactivity with x, x is called void fraction. Void fraction can be defined as the volume fraction of the vapor phase uh, in a mixture of liquid and vapor. Now, when you are dealing with a mixture of two phases a liquid and vapor phase then the density of the mixture can be given by this. Remember here x is the volume fraction or void fraction, but not the mass fraction. This particular definition is particularly relevant to the boiling water reactors. In a boiling water reactor water is used both as a moderator and coolant. Now, with energy supply this uh, water can get converted to the vapor phase and once it becomes gets converted to vapor phase they starts to leave towards the steam drum thereby changing the total nuclear density of uh, the moderator inside the reactor which can affect, affect the uh, scattering process and accordingly it can affect the total number of thermal neutrons available to induce fission thereby reducing the uh, reactivity of the reactor. And this void coefficient of reactivity is uh, a way of relating the reactivity and also the void generation during this uh, phase change process. And so, we can say when alpha v is greater than 0 just similar to this uh, temperature coefficient of reactivity when alpha v is positive 
then whenever there is a change in x, x increases, rho also should increase and as the reactivity increases it will lead to further power production or increase in the power production. As the power production increases that will transfer much larger amount of heat to the moderator and hence there will be further vapor generation. So, x will keep on increasing even further and quite similar to the previous case therefore, alpha v greater than 0 signifies an inherently unstable reactor with uh, I should not write with changes in temperature with changes in void fraction. Similarly, when alpha v is less than 0 in that case when x increases rho reduces as the rho is reducing then corresponding power production from the reactor also reduces hence lesser amount of energy is transferred to the moderator thereby reducing the total void generation and that therefore, tries to reduce this x itself acting like a feedback mechanism. So, alpha v less than 0 leads to an inherently stable reactor to changes in void fraction it should not be temperature again changes in void fraction. Therefore, uh, we have seen the temperature coefficient of reactivity should be negative for a stable operation similarly this void coefficient of reactivity should also be negative. Uh, the boiling water reactors with negative alpha v can achieve automatic load following capability because just the way I have mentioned uh, they couple the load on the turbine with the recirculation flow systems. So, whenever there is an increase in the load on the turbine the flow through the reactor also increases and uh, as flow through the recirculation channel that also increases and as the flow through the recirculation channel increases the power produced uh, or if the power production remains constant then the void production inside the reactor that should reduce because total mass of coolant has increased, but power is the same and as the void fraction reduces because of the negative value of alpha v that will cause an increase in the value of reactivity. That means, what I are saying when the load increases total mass flow rate of coolant that increases and if power remains constant an increase in mass flow rate will reduce the x and because of the negative value of alpha v that will cause an increase in the value of rho and once rho increases total q dot increases total power production that will also increase which of course, will try to get the x back to its original value, but that will uh, achieve something called the automatic load following capability. So, in a nutshell we want both temperature coefficient of negative uh, temperature coefficient of reactivity to be negative and void coefficient of reactivity also to be negative for stable operation of a reactor. Next let us uh, check the effect of fuel burn up we have seen the effect of temperature now fuel burn up or the change in the fuel fraction inside the reactor. Let us consider an infinite thermal reactor which is operating based upon uranium. Now we remember that natural uranium generally comprises of three different isotopes uranium 235 about 0.7 percent uranium 238. 99.3 percent and very stressed quantity of uranium 234. Here we are neglecting uranium 234 because that hardly has any kind of nuclear characteristics. Then there should be two different isotopes present inside the reactor two different fuel isotopes I should say uranium 235 and 238. But here we are also mentioning plutonium 239. Now from where the plutonium may come into picture because of this the non fission capture reaction of uranium. Uranium 238 absorbs one neutron and to produce uranium 239 which goes through two different steps of beta decay to produce plutonium 239. This particular reaction is called breeder reaction and this particular reaction is the basis of fast breeder reactors which we shall be seeing studying in a later module. So, uh, let us uh, check all these three isotopes or their concentration separately. Here we are using one uh, shorthand notation uranium 235 is represented as 25. Actually to denote this kind of notation we first uh, use the last number of this and the last number of this. Accordingly say uranium 233 that will take come taking this 2 and taking this 3 will be called 3. Similarly, 94 P u 239 is a shorthand notation it should use this 4 
and should this 9 49. This way we sometimes use a shorthand notation to denote isotopes during uh, such mathematical analysis. So, this is the corresponding equation uranium 235 uh, there is no source of production, but it decays by absorption of uh, neutron and uh, then we rearrange the equation and we get this exponential solution. Similarly, uranium 238 what should be its notation we are taking this 2 and then we are taking this 8. So, it should be denoted as 28. So, it also goes through the decay process there is no source of producing uranium 238 as well. So, uh, we get a very similar exponential reaction here n not 25 and n not 28 represents their initial concentrations. Now, let us consider a scenario where phi is 10 to the power 13 uh, and uh, in we want to calculate the time required to reduce the number of uranium uh, 235 isotopes to half of the initial value. Then calculations means putting in uh, this number here and also this phi here and also the using the value of sigma a for 25. Sigma a for 25 will be this 100 plus 580 that is 680 we get this time to be 3.23 years. That is to reduce the number of 230 U235 isotopes to half of its original value we need more than 3 years. And then how much will be the change in the concentration of uranium 238 over that period? Total absorption cross section for uranium 238 is uh, extremely small because its fission cross section is 0 and capture cross section is just 2.7 and now putting T equal to 3.232 years in this expression and also corresponding value of phi and sigma c we get n 28 by n naught over that same period to be 0 0.997. That means, there is a hardly any change in the concentration of uranium 238 and hence uranium 238 concentration can be assumed to be constant. Next we move to plutonium. Plutonium as a short for notation is 49. This is the corresponding conservation equation. Here are two terms. This is the decay rate of uranium 238 because of which this plutonium is getting formed and this is the decay rate of plutonium itself. So, we rearrange the terms and as already mentioned this can be assumed to be a constant because n 28 remains a constant and this also a constant. So, we are having a form like this. So, rearranging we can uh, write like this we are multiplying both equation to e to the power k 1 into t sorry ok sorry by performing the integration we are getting a form like this because here e to the power k 1 t is the uh, integrating factor. And now at t equal to 0 concentration of plutonium can be neglected because it will uh, start forming in the reactor only because of the decay of uranium 238. So, taking a concentration of N 49 to be 0 at t equal to 0, we get this constant of integration this kappa to be equal to minus C 2 upon C 1 and putting this, this is the final expressions of plutonium. So, when we are analyzing over a long period of time, such changes in the concentration of all these isotopes should also be need to be taken into consideration because that can affect the reactivity as well. In this particular analysis, we have considered plut only plutonium isotope to be 239, but certain situation plutonium 239 may also go through two steps of neutron capture to form plutonium 241 or sometimes even plutonium 240 also, but uh, that have neg been neglected here. And also plutonium 239 can get formed uh, in both resonance capture and thermal energy region. And when that is considered, we get an expressions like this. Here, uh, if so, this is the first fission factor, P f is the no, first fission factor, then P f is the first fission non leakage probability and small p is the resonance escape probability. And uh, this is the neutron production because of the decay of uh, first neutron production because of the decay of uranium 235 and this is the first neutron production because of the decay of plutonium 239. Please go through these reactions properly and uh, you will be able to understand. Let me go through quickly to the last part of this uh, particular module where we shall be discuss about fission product poisoning. Poisons refers to certain isotopes which may appear following uh, radioactive decay of the fission products which has extremely high absorption cross section like xenon 135 and samarium 149. And they uh, have extremely high neutron absorption cross section and therefore, they can 
uh, significantly affect the neutron flux distribution. Now, their effect on the multiplication factor will come solely through the fuel utilization factor and therefore, reactivity can also be written somewhat like this, where f or k refers to the general situation this is and f naught and k naught refers to the situation without the presence of any poison. Now, f naught is like this the fuel utilization factor without the presence of uh, poisons will be the macroscopic absorption cross section of the fuel divided by the same for fuel and moderator together whereas, f will be where we also need to consider the effect of this poison. And uh, if we put the terms back into original expressions then rho comes to be something like this. Now, for an unpoisoned critical reactor then uh, we know k can be represented like this uh, for a critical reactor of course. So, we are rearranging the terms and then taking uh, this uh, sigma a f plus sigma a m into back into this particular equation we get uh, such an expression for this reactivity in terms of the macroscopic absorption cross section of this poison. Now, uh, this xenon 135 that can appear by two ways one is there is 0 0.25 per percent 0 0.25 percent probability of appearing directly from fission other is this uh, T 135 and iodine 135 both can be produced during fission actually T 135 has an extremely small half life only 19 seconds. So, its presence can completely be neglected and it can be assumed that uh, iodine 135 has a fission yield of about 6.4 percent and uh, this iodine has a 70 percent probability of going through a beta decay to produce this xenon 135, but that is basically the primary reaction iodine 135 it is half life is also very small only 6.6 .6 hours. So, it gets converted to this xenon 135. So, if we write the expression for iodine then rate of change of this iodine concentration has two parts this is the uh, production here gamma refers to its fission yield which is this 3.3 plus 3.1 percent and uh, macroscopic fission cross section multiplied by the thermal neutron flask and then this is its uh, reduction uh, that is uh, its uh, decay rate into the number of neutrons uh, we rearrange the terms to get a distribution like iodine this way. But xenon now there are two roots we have found that can get produced directly from fission or because of the decay of iodine and also there are two ways it may disappear one is it can uh, it is actually radioactive in nature. So, it can go through a beta decay to produce cesium other is it can absorb a neutron to produce uh, xenon 136 which is a iso which is a stable isotope and it have a very small absorption cross section. So, this is uh, the uh, expression for xenon before that putting in this previous expression at t tends to infinity we get the equilibrium concentration of iodine. But rate of change of xenon has this is its production because of the decay of iodine and this is its production uh, because directly from the fission this is its decay to through the beta decay procedure and this is the neutron capture part. So, we rearrange the term and uh, here this part written in red can be assumed to be an effective uh, decay constant for the xenon 135. And, uh, half life for both iodine and xenon being quite small xenon has a half life it is shown here uh, the xenon has a half life of just 9.2 hours. So, both being quite small and also the sigma a for xenon being such a large amount value their concentrations quickly rise to reach the equilibrium. We have already seen the equilibrium concentration of iodine and putting this values here we can uh, get the equilibrium concentration of xenon to be like this. And proceeding further in this equilibrium concentration we are using to calculate the macroscopic cross section means once we multiply this with the uh, sorry once we multiplying this equilibrium concentration to the corresponding absorption microscopic absorption cross section we get the corresponding macroscopic absorption cross section this here this uh, phi x c is actually the lambda by sigma a for xenon it is a temperature dependent parameter its value is uh, this amount for 20 degree Celsius and changes quite rapidly with temperature. Now, this was the expression for rho that we have obtained earlier. So, once we put this expression for this sigma a xenon which is the poison in this case we get an expression like this. 
once this uh, phi thermal is extremely small compared to the phi xenon then rho uh, is found to be a linear function of this phi thermal for low flux situations on the contrary when phi thermal itself is extremely high compared to this phi xenon then uh, rho equilibrium uh, remains nearly a constant number that is it is independent of the phi thermal at high flux situations and if we assume an infinite reactor with rho and epsilon to sorry epsilon and p to be equal to 1 this equilibrium value of rho comes to be minus 2.73 percent which is roughly minus 4 dollar uh, taking the value of uranium 235. The other important poison is samarium 149. Uh, it actually can produce only because of the beta decay, two successive beta decay process N D 149 is directly produced from fission that goes to a beta decay to produce P M 149 and then further beta decay produce S M 149. S M 149 is a stable isotope, so there is no radioactive decay possible for this, but it is uh, uh, it has a extremely high absorption cross sections. 42,000 bonds. You probably have noticed the absorption cross section for xenon that was given earlier. Xenon 135 is an absorption cross section of the order of 10 to the power 6 bonds. So, uh, this SM 149 absorbing neutron becomes SM 150. This is the equation for PM in a number of concentration for PM. This is its fission yield and this is the decay rate. Correspondingly, we get uh, it is an equilibrium concentration like this. And now we write the equation for SM. It again has just one way of producing that is by decay of PM and one way of consuming because of the neutron capture. Accordingly, we get this equilibrium concentration to be like this. And then we calculate corresponding macroscopic cross section to get the value for an infinite reactor with P and epsilon equal to 1 to be just point minus 0.442 percent about minus 68 cents. So, it is uh, much smaller compared to the xenon, but still quite significant from reactivity control. You please go through these slides, these calculations, these are being just a repetition of earlier calculations. I have gone through them quickly, but please try to do on your own. So, this brings us towards the end of uh, this particular module, where we have discussed different effects of different parameters on reactivity. And uh, the key points that we have learned from module 6 is that the prompt neutron lifetime is uh, virtually equal to the diffusion period by thermal neutron because scattering period is extremely small. Delayed neutron play a very crucial role in reactor control, particularly the reactivity should be limited to the magnitude of delayed neutron fraction to have a controlled reaction. We have discussed about the role of control rods and chemical schemes etcetera. Control rods are generally used for immediate reactivity control, whereas chemical schemes generally compensate for initially high activity of fuel or for slow control chemical scheme can be used. Then we have discussed about the effect of fuel burn up, the effect of temperature we have discussed the prompt new temperature coefficient and void reactivity coefficient both should be negative for stable operation. The burn up uh, also must be considered for analyzing long term transient particularly the appearance of different isotopes of plutonium is very important even in a uranium uh, rich reactor. And finally, we have discussed about the role of two neutron poisons xenon 135 and SM 149. Uh, both of them has been found to affect the reactivity quite significantly. So, that is it for the sixth module where I have discussed about the topic of reactivity control and in this particular lecture we have discussed about the effects of different parameters like fuel burn up, temperature and neutron poisons on reactivity. In a practical reactor all these factors need to be taken into consideration while deciding the, fine, uh, the role of the controlling mechanisms or the activity of the controlling mechanisms. So, thanks for your attention. In the next week, we shall be moving to the seventh module where we shall be talking about the thermal reactors. So, bye for now.